practice for over 45 years. Uh, my background uh, is in family medicine, but also military, and I was a combat physician. The important part here is that I am retired and I do this because of, I do this lecturing and studying for cannabinoids because I know that it can have a huge impact on the health of Mexicans as well as the entire globe. And it's very important to get out this information. And with my experience, I've learned a great deal and I continue to learn on a daily basis. Now today I'm gonna to answer three main questions. One is about uh, how cannabinoids can help with metabolic disease, also addiction, and also dementia. I've got a lot of material to cover, but I'm really excited to be able to present this to you. I think you'll find it extremely valuable. And for those officials or those people in uh, important decision-making processes, I hope that this will give you an idea of why I'm so passionate and how this can help your people. Now, number one up is the metabolic disease. Now, metabolic disease really encompasses several different problems that we're encompassing. And I think the bottom line here for the United States, because that's the only one I can give an example for, is that only 12% of the US population appears metabolically healthy. Everybody else is having variations of one of these syndromes, these metabolic disorders. Now, how do we approach that? Well. First of all, the mechanism of disease. I just address this briefly that there's typically insulin resistance, there's increase in the serum glucose, there's a loss of insulin production, that that's kind of a late effect as because the pancreatic beta cells are start to um, invert or stop to uh, die and they're no longer working. But the big thing that I wanna point out to you is the huge amount of disabling complications that occur with these metabolic diseases. And these are, these are going to affect the, uh, the, the joy, uh, the age, uh, and the productivity of all of the members of your country. Now, traditionally, we've thought about the causes for metabolic disease of being processed food, overeating, inactivity, stress, but I wanna bring up the huge and important area of environmental toxins. Now, recently there has been a study that looked at chemical toxins as being an explanation for the obesity epidemic, and that corresponds to the metabolic disorders that we're encompassing. So you're seeing a graph of some of the different chemicals and uh, that have been uh, produced in the, in the past. And you're also seeing in blue, then the overweight and the metabolic disease by correlation uh, that also is occurring. Now, this is just observational, but I think it's key and important to make us inquire deeper in, into this. There's more correlation with the uh, epidemic of global pesticides and as well as the global epidemic of metabolic disorders. So why would people who have been eating a traditional diet for uh, centuries suddenly develop this major problem with metabolic disorders? And I, I want to tie that to the correlation that global pesticides may have an important role in that particular process. Now, one of the main areas for the uh, disease entity, uh, particularly, for example, in the heart and the cardiovascular areas, is this cannabinoid type one receptor that really lies at the core of many of the problems that we encounter in our body. Now, hyperglycemia, uh, high glucose leads to uh, this sort of uh, disordered signaling and then inflammatory responses, fibrosis, and a number of different uh, disease entities uh, that are characterized uh, for metabolic disorders. CBD has a particular effect in blocking this overactivity of the endocannabinoid system and focusing very particularly uh, in this process and the generation of this disease and actually working at the cannabinoid type one receptor, blocking it so that there is, can be a recovery uh, of the body and moving forward. We know that cannabidiol uh, in particular of the cannabinoids improves glucose and insulin. It prevents pancreatic and liver damage. It protects the nerves. It prevents complications. 
It prevents heart and artery disease. And here's a big one. I think it's really important that actually the cannabinoids prevent the progression of diabetes. They can stop the damage that is done for the beta cells in the pancreas so that we can preserve as much function as possible. Imagine type one diabetes stopping it as it initiates. So this is a great opportunity for um, controlling uh, the progression of this like type one type of diabetes, the autoimmune portion, but also for type two. Now CBD actually has effects on uh, cellular mechanisms, including uh, uh, increasing the consumption of glucose, because remember we're having, we're dealing with a glucose uh, and insulin resistance. So it helps to consume glucose in the body by shifting some of the metabolic profiles and it promotes the anti-inflammatory natural substance of glutathione. So helping uh, preserve and protect uh, the body and those important cells in the pancreas. There's other more exotic pathways that CBD and cannabinoids are involved with. This one involves the sorbitol pathway. And it appears that I know this is obscure, but it is very, very important because it is the pathway that appears to be involved in all of the complications of uh, diseases of um, hyperglycemia, protecting the nerves, the eyes, the kidneys, the blood vessels, and the heart. And the effects go right down to the level of the mitochondria. So we're seeing an increased energy output and they're actually a promotion of new uh, mitochondria being formed uh, with this type of stimulation. Studies that have been done in this area, for instance, in prediabetes. So you haven't got diabetes, but you're starting to get those metabolic signs. And we think of prediabetes as being a metabolic disease. And though this study took only 10 individuals, it was a safety study that was being looked at. They took 10 individuals and found that five of them had the signs and the chemical evidence for prediabetes. But after only 30 days of using uh, cannabinoid, that corrected entirely. And so they completely resolved their particular uh, signs and the laboratory in that small study. But it's a very good indicator of what we can expect in larger groups. One of the ways that um, high glucose causes damage is actually on the lining of the blood vessels called the uh, glycocalyx. There is a lubrication and a protective barrier that is on these blood vessels and a high carbohydrate meal in a diabetic actually damages this protective layer. You can think of it uh, much like you would um, um, oil on the skin or that would be protective against drying out um, in, your, in your body. We have the same type of protection in our gut, um, in our bladder, and all our organs that are coming in contact with other tissues. Now here, it's important because this kind of damage uh, to this lining of the blood vessel leaves it vulnerable to inflammatory diseases. What we find is that cannabinoids can help protect this endothelial lining and it protects it from the damage that occurs and the disease uh, that would be associated with vascular disease. So we're talking about things like atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. Now here's an area that just came through to me and I was very excited to be able to share this with you. There's actually a study that came out of Chicago uh, that was released on, on my mailbox that was today. Um, you'll see that it's 2021 showing that 10% uh, of 93,000 patients that they saw in their records actually tested positive uh, for uh, COVID. Whereas only um, cannabis users only represented 5.7%. However, when they drilled down into those patients who were prescribed uh, cannabidiol, they actually found there was 1.2% um, of those. And when they matched that to a non-cannabinoid using, using patient, they found that the rate of COVID was as high as 12%. So it looks like um, CBD is, is effective against the variants of COVID, which we're very much worried about now. And of course, cannabidiol and hemp uh, cannabis doesn't require any injection or a hospital setting, but the purity and the quality of this is very important. Now, 
a public health take home message here is that we have, this is a great opportunity. We've got major concerns about metabolic health. We may be able to um, intervene and stop the progression and uh, cannabinoids may be able to control the damage and the risk of complications uh, from uh, this type of disease as well as viral entities. Now, it turns out that cannabis crops would avoid pesticides, reduce water, and uh, its use would restore the soil to its um, excellence uh, and the quality of its era. So a great opportunity for leaders in Mexico uh, to move forward in this area for all of the benefits that are present. Let me talk now about how would uh, the cannabinoids help with regard to uh, chronic pain and addiction. What ways uh, can, as a public health issue, could we benefit uh, from using cannabinoids? First off, we know that chronic pain is a huge problem in the United States, um, and I'm sure that it's a big problem in Mexico. Um, billions of dollars are uh, involved with it. But what I want to point out here is that this is a vicious cycle that this isn't just occurring uh, with just the pain. It affects all portions of an active life. And so it's involving many, many different sectors and the whole family, and of course, uh, public health, because people who become uh, injured or uh, die um, are no longer able to be productive in your society. Furthermore, what we know about chronic pain is that it's a lot more than just the pain. It in, includes many of the things that I've listed here, including insomnia, sexual dysfunction, suicide risk, um, reduced functional capacity, low self-esteem. So a real large area that is covered uh, with chronic pain and it involves eating disorders as well. So that might even worsen the metabolic conditions. Now, the problem with chronic pain medications right now is that it's uh, treating the physical pain, but it's not treating the whole patient. Um, the current understanding about narcotics is that they inhibit healing and immunity, and there's a need uh, for consistently higher doses. There's addictive behavior and withdrawal that occur with these da dangerous substances, and uh, there's physical and cognitive impairments. Uh, overdose and death are actually pandemic from the uh, synthetic type of opioids that we're now seeing. What we know is that the endocannabinoid system is intimately involved with these particular receptors and that there is a way for us to use these cannabinoids to modulate the way that opioids work and even uh, bypass the use for opioids, and, but you still use the system. What we know is that the cannabinoid receptors are actually co-located in the brain and in the addiction centers with those opioid receptors. So they're working together. It's a, it's a harmony that's occurring. And let's capitalize on the use of uh, the cannabinoids in order to uh, control that pain and that particular receptor system. In addiction, what we see is we're having a problem with um, it, in this endocannabinoid system, there's this down regulation of the cannabinoid type one receptor. It's disturbed uh, uh, binding. It's not working properly. And when someone goes into abstinence with their addiction, they actually have a significant recovery uh, of the cannabinoid type two, type one receptors. So it's very important, important in this particular process. Now, cannabinoids uh, are anti-addictive in the brain. They inhibit the sensitization, and they block the reconsolidation, um, they inhibit the drug-seeking behavior, they prevent cell death and uh, preserve the uh, brain volume uh, that is present, and it sustains the effects after treatment, typical uh, at least a week after a single dose. It inhibits anxiety, epilepsy, brain injury, like with alcohol. So a host of particular benefits that could really mitigate against the addictive problems that we face, not just with opioids, but with all substances and all chemicals. Now, here's a study that talks about exactly that, the use of uh, cannabinoids uh, and extracts on opioid use. And what these, these, this particular study found was that 
most of the patient had a significant improvement in not only their pain, but also the associated symptoms. And in this particular group out of California, that, that was a pain management group, that uh, cannabinoid extracts were uh, enabled their patients to reduce or eliminate opioids uh, with a significant improvement in the quality of life. So all of those host of things that are associated with chronic pain and of course addiction. And there's further evidence, and I want to share some of the other studies that have been done. So we've got excellent evidence uh, that uh, this can be very effective uh, for patients um, and that it can be quite valuable in dealing with very significant type of pain. And here's the study that shows the acute single dose was able to preserve um, and protect uh, against addiction and withdrawal for seven days um, after in 42 individuals. So quite valuable uh, potential here. So what's the public health take home? What can they do? What, what, how can public health use this? Well, first off, uh, hemp cannabis offers some major potential for assisting everybody uh, in all addictions and addressing both physical and behavioral regulation with safety and long duration. So it's not just uh, something that has to keep on going, and it's an oral dosing, so quite valuable, and it should be a major part of uh, all of our work in the addiction area. Um, hemp cannabis may be an ideal basic medicine for families for all types of physical or behavioral stress, I mean, including pain, so something that's in the medicine cabinet that is something available to every one of the families that they can use to protect themselves from the stress uh, and uh, control for many of the, the, the minor pains and sometimes even major pain that uh, they experience. Now let's talk about a subject that is uh, key and important um, that I'm very interested in. Um, how can cannabinoids help with regard to the public health issue of dementia uh, and impaired um, uh, brain function as a result of neurodegeneration? I've listed off uh, several of the different tower problems that we frequently encounter in medicine and uh, recognizing that this is a huge problem around the world. Um, it's the third leading cause of death in the United States. If you look at the real cause, the underlying causes uh, for individuals, and it takes a toll not only on the individual, of course, but also on the family caregivers and the economy, uh, extracting um, billions of dollars on a yearly basis to help people. And it's not just in the United States. The world is encountering many of these types of problems with uh, neurodegenerative uh, declines. So it's an important problem for low and middle income countries, as well as the major developed countries, because we don't have a solution for it. Now, what's involved with Alzheimer's disease is a host of different uh, types of issues. And I display this slide to give you an idea of the wide range of causes uh, that are associated uh, with uh, the, the disease and the neurodegenerative type, types of changes. And so it encompasses a wide area. But <clears throat> the final uh, is very clear of death and nursing home and impairment um, of function. We're all familiar with amyloid plaques uh, that incur inside of cells and then the neurofiber fibrillary uh, tangles or the tau uh, material that is between cells. And this gives you an idea of what they, they look at, but I wanna carry it one step further. That amyloid, that material that we're talking about in those plaques is actually an antimicrobial and toxic metal binder. So it has a role and it has a benefit uh, that it occurs in people. So it's not a matter of eliminating this, it's going to occur and it actually has a phy physiologic role when it's regulated and controlled. The problem is that it gets out of control. And one of the mechanisms that we talk about in that is in that process is that when amyloids builds up to a high level, it interferes with the blood brain barrier and it allows leakage of some of these chemicals that are inflammatory chemicals that are inside the blood in getting into the brain and worsening any inflammation that's occurring. It's also degenerative, neurodegenerative conditions are also related to mitochondrial dysfunction. 
And so it's playing a role here and where you have damage and it is worsening as a result. Now, if we look at the drug industry and what they've done in the particular area, what we know now is that 99% of the drugs that have been studied over the last 20 years have not been successful at making any clinical impact um, in dementia. So we can't look at pharmaceuticals as being the answer for this progressive illness. What we're learning now is that one of the key mechanisms involved may be a diabetes type three, that is an insulin resistance actually occurring in the brain and forcing and stimulating the accumulation of amyloid beta and some of the tau uh, bundles that are actually occurring and its association with type 2 diabetes. There's a very close association and it appears that they are connected. What about the cannabinoids? We know that the cannabinoids actually can modulate um, many of these different processes. I've displayed a number of these different mechanisms, but we have a number of different targets about the way that cannabinoids can be effective in uh, mitigating against neurodegenerative conditions. On the blood-brain barrier, we know that very specifically, it bolsters uh, that barrier. So to preserve the um, and prevent the leakage of um, chemicals into the brain is protected by using uh, CBD and other uh, cannabinoids as well. So we're offering uh, some additional protection for the brain to reduce the progression and maybe stop or even reverse this particular entity. Now the cannabinoids are very effective on mitochondria as well, where that we know that they increase the energy output and increase the new mitochondrial formation. So very valuable and preventing death of these particular organelles, as well as the neurologic cells that are depending on um, the energy that's coming from it. Now, one other area that is quite impressive is the neurogenesis, the development of new nerves and the nerve connections that can occur with the cannabinoids. This is particularly valuable because we need to keep regenerating uh, these particular nerves. They need to be um, redeveloping connections as we learn and as we dismiss uh, information. So we're getting a, quite a bit of stimulation and a prevention of the disordered uh, type of function that can occur in the brain under inflammation. Now, here's an example of an Israeli study where an 81 year old man uh, who was diagnosed with dementia after he had a stroke like event. The cannabinoids were used in his case to manage the spasticity, but within a few days, he was actually alert and greeting his granddaughter. The improvements persisted, uh, being more alert and responsive, maintaining eye contact. And of course, his spasticity increased, uh, sig uh, decreased significantly uh, during the whole course of therapy. And this was a matter of within one week and progressed uh, for uh, longer than one month. Quite a valuable uh, testimonial um, and observational study. But this has occurred uh, even for my own patients. I've seen the same uh, different, same uh, benefits. Now, one of the things that we have to think about is how do you deal with agitation? Um, in people with dementia. Now, com in this particular study, they were looking at how cannabinoids could be used, and they determined that uh, cannabinoids were a promising agent for the anxiolytic and the antidepressant um, and the anti-aggressive uh, effects of these particular disease. For, so this, this would be valuable you know, for both patients on uh, nursing homes and as well as caregivers. Uh, here's my own case of, and you see uh, that this 61 year old woman who shows aggressive behavior in the upper image. And then in the lower image, you find that she's a docile, um, friendly and cooperative and even smiling. And that occurred over the course of uh, three weeks. So a dramatic changes on uh, that we see and I see clinically in this particular process. We also know there's evidence coming out and you see again that this is a current study that shows that the cannabinoids are effective in reversing proteinopathies. So the formation of um, plaques, amyloid plaques are actually a disordered mechanism of 
of a proteinopathy where you're building up these particular materials because they're misfolded. Well, the cannabinoids can stop that process. And there is a great potential for stopping the neurodegeneration for uh, things like, of course, um, Alzheimer's, but also for Parkinson's and even um, for uh, patients with Down syndrome who have a progression of uh, dementia in the same manner as Alzheimer's. What's the public health take home? Uh, dementia is gonna be a major burden to all nations, but treatment and managing the therapies are really quite poor right at, at the present time. Hemp cannabis can be effective for prevention, treatment and management and incorporated into the public sector. Uh, hemp cannabis can be effective for the caregivers stress as well as for the patients. I think there's enormous potential and enormous value that hemp cannabis can offer to Mexico and uh, the entire globe and the people that are there, improving the quality of life as well as mitigating against much of the suffering that we encounter uh, across the world. And so with that, I wanna conclude this uh, particular lecture and I've got my contact information and I certainly would be happy to take questions if there's any time. Thank you very much, Dr. Blair. How are you? Good mo morning. Um, we are very thankful for your presentation, Dr. Blair. There are several questions. I'm gonna start with some of them and maybe we can do three by three. Uh, questions. And the first one would be besides. I'm sorry, you know, for diabetes. some reason, I'm, um, my sound is, I'm not getting, um, ah, there we go. Okay, how's this? Great. Your go sound ahead. is great. Dr. Blair, can you hear me? I hear you now. Perfect. Um, well, there are several questions. I'll start with the first one. And uh, besides diabetes, other metabolic disorders might affect the, the development of dementia. That's the first one. And the second one, what would be the ideal cannabinoid profile for fighting diabetes? And which other cannabinoids other than CBD would you also recommend for a formulation for this matter? Well, uh, with regard to the metabolic diseases leading to neurodegenerative conditions, I see it as, as quite the spectrum where you have diabetes, you have prediabetes, you have obesity, uh, you have um, the metabolic uh, disorders that are occurring as a result of interference by perhaps some of the pesticides, as well as uh, some of the foods, that, uh, processed foods that we're experiencing. Elimination of those processed foods and pesticides would help along that area. Uh, essentially, we're talking about a, um, a hyperglycemia, and what we're defining more accurately is a hyperinsulinemia, where high levels of insulin are occurring as a result of inappropriate stimulation uh, to the body. And so this represents a broad range of conditions that can manifest in a number of ways. One of the areas that is particularly uh, vexing is the area of liver disease. Fatty liver disease is a very serious problem that's leading to uh, transplants. In fact, it's a leading uh, reason for transplants in the United States now, not as a result of infections, but rather this inflammatory condition. So all of these metabolic uh, concerns and disorders are actually having an impact, whether it's genetic uh, that leads to this hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia leading to the neurodegeneration um, and the inflammatory situation that's occurring mm, in the brain. Now, the other question that has to do about what's the right formula? Well, we don't know exactly what that kind of formulation is, but it should be a full spectrum. And ideally, in my experience, it, it can be a low THC uh, type of product um, that, it, that will help um, reduce uh, the stress on the body, cancel out the inflammation, and help correct some of the metabolic defects that come from some of the toxins as well as processed foods that are probably leading us in this direction for metabolic disease. Thank you very much. You talked a lot about the inner or the stretch relation between opioids uh, or the uh, and, uh, opioid system and the, and the cannabinoid system, but can CBD treat other kind of um, addictions, for example, alcoholism, and how? 
Great question. Yes. Uh, so um, the question is, uh, can uh, the cannabinoids treat other types of addiction? And absolutely yes. And in one of my slides, I pointed out that one of the effects uh, of the cannabinoids is actually uh, for all of the addictive pathways, whether that's behavioral or it's food or it's chemical, that, that uh, the cannabinoids have a particular ability to reduce that um, craving uh, that we encounter and to reduce a withdrawal. I've seen that with opioids, benzodiazepines. And here's an interesting point is that you can treat uh, children uh, who have alcoholic syndrome that they actually, their, their mothers had, had been drinking alcohol and they had fetal alcohol syndrome as a child. You can actually cre uh, treat um, many of their problems by using cannabinoids to help them uh, typically, again, it's a full spectrum, but with a low type of THC that's involved. So in all of the, the substances that we come in uh, contact with um, that are addictive, we can actually mitigate against many of those, including cigarette smoking. Excellent. And you also um, talk a lot about uh, pain drugs. Uh, in your experience, you found that it's good to make complementary treatments with um, uh, pain drugs and cannabinoids, or do you tend to substitute them? Well, for dealing with patients, it's hard to take things away from patients. And because there is no significant interaction, it's safe and effective to combine the cannabinoids with what they're taking as they perhaps hopefully reduce uh, the amount. And I, as they get the experience and they, they learn what the benefits can be, then they can reduce the other medications so they're not requiring them anymore and avoid uh, the associations. Now, some individuals are, have a particular potential for addiction. When they get into opioids as a result of their genetic makeup, then they can develop addictions very easily. And uh, for those people, it may be absolutely important for them to avoid using opioids, if at all, and to rely on the cannabinoids. Patients, many, many patients have explained to me that they have been able to rely on uh, using CBD um, after hospitalization, not requiring any other pain medications in order to help them with their symptoms uh, after surgery. There's another question. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Would you use rather use whole plant extracts or try uh, different formulations with, uh, for example, THC and CBD isolated to control the dosage uh, on a very more precise uh, way? Well, that's a good question that uh, should we use um, full spectrum or should we use isolates uh, created into a blend, a specific blend and formulations? Well, right now, we don't have a whole lot of information in that regard. I mean, there is the potential that we could find a blend for both the cannabinoids and the terpenes that might be ideal for individual patients or individual type of problems. The problem that we encounter constantly is that every individual responds um, differently. And when you looked at the different causes for dementia, you saw a whole host of different issues that occur. And even autism has a wide range of particular causes. Now, is that formulation going to be able to uh, target that common pathway and correct for all those disorders? I have pretty much abandoned the idea that, that we're going to have silver bullet type of medicines that are going to be able to resolve any particular disease and that we're going to look at different um, balances for the individual patient and different blends that are going to be effective. And until we have enough information where we have evidence for using particular blends, then I'm gonna rely um, more because of safety and effectiveness on a um, more natural blend, albeit in perhaps different proportions um, based on perhaps the cultivar or, or with maybe some supplementation of terpenes or additional cannabinoids for particular issues that are common in a disease. You stated it would be great for the entire family to use CBD as a preventative to stress and metabolic diseases. 
but what would be just suggestions on a ever average daily dose for such a preventative measure and not to attend an, a particular condition? Uh, so how would you use uh, the cannabinoids to help with daily stress or improve and prevent aging or to manage uh, performance? So a small doses are often very effective. Uh, so that I um, mean, in my experience, um, things uh, doses in the range of, um, of uh, 10 to 15 milligrams can be quite effective at maintaining uh, performance um, and protecting people from a number of the stresses, both the uh, stresses from inflammation and then uh, bolstering that and increasing those doses um, as needed uh, to control for particular syndromes that occur, such as a bite, burn, sting, uh, bruise, um, those particular or particular stress that people encounter. So a baseline dose I think is, is and I would recommend, and of course I do myself, to maintain uh, resilience um, and uh, responsiveness and uh, cognitive and physical functioning. So definitely. But the maximum dosage, uh, with that it, there is no maximum dosage that we know about. When we have seen, what we've seen with uh, using um, epidiolex, which is uh, pretty much a purified CBD, that therapeutic doses have been in the range of uh, as much as um, 1,000 milligrams uh, on a daily basis, and they've been safe. Uh, what I find with the full spectrums is that you don't need that much. You don't need a fraction of that. Uh, to treat different conditions. And for a maintenance level, if we're tweaking the endocannabinoid system, when, then we can get it tuned up as long as we have support uh, for the cannabinoids, such as omega-3 types of oils, good and healthy diet, avoiding processing and processed foods and avoiding chemicals in our environment. On regards of Parkinson's disease, does it need to be treated with a high level of THC? Well, with regard to Parkinson's disease and uh, can cannabis uh, treatment, now it seems to be uh, quite a range of effects. I've seen uh, excellent response to um, a higher THC and also to lower THC. So I think you can achieve um, e both uh, benefits uh, that occur. There is, does seem to be some evidence uh, for the use of THC um, and in some higher quantities in order to um, calm down some of the reactions that are having. But I've also seen an excellent response to using uh, CBD. Now, the advantage of uh, one of the advantages of uh, CBD, of course, is a very little interaction uh, that will uh, generally occurs and that you have um, overall. Uh, benefits in well-being, uh, and then that's occurred with studies. But CBD alone has not been um, as effective as uh, using some THC in the portion. Now, we don't know what the right quantity is, but I think it's uh, well worth um, adding that as a supplement in an inc incremental fashion. Now, I like to use the base of the, um, the full spectrum, low THC, and then if people need additional assistance, then to add THC in some small incremental amounts to achieve the objective and the benefits that, that you're looking for in the use of cannabinoids for the, that condition. And what are the best forms of CBD administration for Parkinson's disease? Well, one of the beauties of using cannabinoids in any type of disease entity is that it's, it can be taken um, by orally as a capsule. It can be sublingually absorbed through the mucous membrane. <clears throat> it can be vaporized. It can be used topically. And all of these ways are actually quite effective uh, for using the cannabinoids. People have to find uh, the style that uh, works best for them. Now, my particular orientation is for using a sublingual approach since we get uh, the effects occur very, very rapidly in that particular process. And so I, I like that. Now, an area that I'm particularly interested in exploring is using vaporized um, cannabinoids uh, to deliver to the brain. 
what I've seen time and again is that you can use very small amounts, uh, both of CBD um, that can deliver to the brain and to the eye, which an eye is an, just an extension that it has been able to reduce inflammation and correct for many of the symptoms that people encounter, including uh, things like chronic pain. So a vaporized portion is, is a very cost-effective if um, patients uh, if, if patients are so aligned and the product can, can be guaranteed not to contain uh, substances that could be damaging. Well, there's another question that says, um, isn't it true that there is a concern about liver dysfunction using CBD slash epidiolex in those high dose protocols? Um, the person asking, Amy, um, she has seen 800 milligrams used three times a day. And how do you balance the metabolic pathway interchange with when using CBD and other AEDs? AEDs? So the topic of liver disease and uh, CBD uh, is a very interesting one that I've looked into. Now, typically these, uh, the levels uh, that people are using to that see these toxicities are massive amounts of uh, CBD. And so 800 milligrams, people are really working into the range of uh, 20 or uh, maybe 50 milligrams uh, uh, per kilogram. Now, no individual um, uh, probably can afford uh, that uh, quantity of CBD and it is an isolate. So remember that it's taking it out of its natural environment. So not being full spectrum. Whereas the typical dose and the average dosing for using epidiolex is about 10 uh, milligrams per kilogram, you can control epilepsy very effectively with a full spectrum um, with less than two milligrams per kilogram. So a small portion, one tenth of the type of dosage that you see with an isolate because you have the entourage and the benefits uh, that are occurring. Now, the other part of those particular studies is that all of these children that were using epidiolex with toxicity actually were taking other anti-epileptic drugs, and, and one in particular that was um, damaging and destructive. And so you, they, there's a full spectrum. It's, um, you have to look at the other medications that also have um, liver issues. Now, one particular study that I particularly keyed on was in the use of anti-thrombotic um, um, uh, type of agent, uh, blood thinning. And we didn't see any interaction uh, with the liver with blood thinning until you got to above um, eight milligrams per kilogram. And again, these are large doses that you that are frequently needed in isolate types of products, whereas a full spectrum doesn't require any of those because of this balanced effect for them from the other uh, cannabinoids. For COVID, you, you talked a little bit about what it seems to be a very positive um, um, option of treatment of CBD with, with COVID, but uh, right now with the knowledge we have right now and the current pandemic, um, what would be a good dosage and, and how would you recommend uh, its administration on COVID patients? So a maintenance dose uh, for using CBD on COVID is going to be in the range of about 15 milligrams uh, twice a day. Um, so, and most people uh, that is going to induce those effects about preventing infection, uh, reducing inflammation, um, and uh, controlling for the, the response that you might have um, by getting a virus. Now, if you uh, succumb and you do get infected, then higher doses are going to be needed in order to uh, control for symptoms that, that might be there. So you uh, just a simple maintenance dose is quite frequently very effective uh, at preventing. I know from personal experience, being on a cruise line in Australia at the time of the outbreak uh, last year in March, where one third of the passengers came down with COVID. My wife and I were totally spared and we've not had any uh, difficulty um, in that entire process. Um, and, and we've not been ill except from uh, the temporary illness that's associated with the immune response from vaccination that occurred um, uh, last month. 
So I, the, a maintenance dose to start with, um, and also supplementing those other things that we know about that are important for preventing viral type infections. Uh, the need for zinc, um, a healthy diet, plenty of rest, um, good quality exercise, and of course, avoiding um, and using masks to avoid uh, those particular viral organisms. But I wanna go a little bit further uh, because the um, uh, CBD has been very effective on al almost all viral illnesses. Um, so we're talking about uh, the potential for um, uh, HIV, um, uh, for herpes simplex virus, uh, for um, hepatitis C virus, and, and a number of the other viral conditions cannabinoids could play a major role in um, mitigating against those diseases and the complications that come from them, in addition to COVID. Excellent. We have a lot of messages thanking you for your awesome presentation. And we are very, very, th um, estamos muy agradecidos. We are very thankful for you being with us today, Dr. Blair. And Please, I, I don't know if you can share again with us your, your contact information, if anyone wants to reach you and keep uh, having the, the conversation after after today. Certainly, um, there, I've, I've actually posted uh, my um, uh, email address. I love to get, I'm happy to take questions and, and respond. You might have a website where you're taking questions that I might go to be a little bit more efficient at that and to accumulate those questions. But I take consultations for people around the world and help guide them uh, using quality products that hopefully are available locally. And I know that there are some excellent products that are available in Mexico and I, I'd like to turn you in that direction if that's the case. These can be quite valuable for a broad range of conditions and I think a major benefit for public health, um, as well as for the individuals in, in Mexico and uh, on a global scale. So I appreciate um, the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. Thank you very much, doctor. Have a nice day. Thank you.